What's up guys, Rick from DFS On Demand here with a preview for the PGA Championship. This week the PGA Championship is being played at Quail Hollow, which should sound pretty familiar because that is a regular tour stop on the PGA Tour. Usually the host of the Wells Fargo Championship, but this year gets a break until August where it's going to be the host for the PGA Championship. So this is pretty rare where we have a major, which is usually a rotating course, that has this much course history like Quail Hollow does because we see it every year. So what I have done is in my spreadsheet and a lot of the things that we're going to talk about this week, I have both PGA Championship history, which is nice to know, but it's not great. But then I also have Quail Hollow history, which is referencing the Wells Fargo Championship. So I've got course history and I have tournament history. You can determine what you want to weigh more. I would prefer course history um, just because the only thing uh, that is similar about tour uh, tournament history is the, to the, pl the place on the schedule, the prize pool, the strength of field, um, not much else that would be relevant to us. So I have the Quail Hollow history as well. Um, what you're looking at is my spreadsheet. So if you're new to this, uh, this spreadsheet's available on DFSOnDemand.com. A lot of different tabs and things that we'll, that we'll go through. But again, both PGA Championship history and Quail Hollow history. Here are my key stats for this week. I've opted to go with two different driving stats for this week, which is something that I rarely do. But I want strokes gained off the tee. Um, these are some of the toughest fairways on tour to hit. And after a little bit of a redesign, um, they might actually be more difficult. Um, the optics are going to change for a lot of players. So I really want uh, guys who can drive the ball really well. And then also it's a long course. Like uh, 7,400 yard par 71, I think. And just absolutely, um, absolutely very, very long and the fact that there is rain in the schedule or rain in the forecast all four days this week makes me think that this thing could play even longer. So you're going to have to be a long hitter, I believe, um, to come out on top this week, or at least it'll be very advantageous for you to do so. Um, then I stuck with the uh, the standard strokes gained approach, strokes gained putting, and bogey avoidance. Bogey avoidance is something that always is always going to pop up on especially the majors just because of how tough the courses usually play. And, um, you know, it's not going to be 20 under par to win this thing unless it gets wet and Rory tears it apart like he did a few years ago. But, um, and then finally I opted for par four scoring in the 450 to 500 yard range. So this is, um, I believe there's eight holes that fit this criteria. So nearly half the holes are going to be playing in this range as par fours. Um, you'll see who jumps out on top and it's, it's DJ, which should be no surprise, but we'll talk more about him later. Um, this field is pretty wide open though. He's a 90, but other than that, there's a lot of guys between 70 and 83. So again, just like last week, a lot of, um, a lot of players who can win this thing. Okay. So let's look at the lobby. Let's start going through some of these guys. So Jordan Spieth going for the career grand slam. Um, you know, playing out of his mind right now, playing really great. He will be chalk. Rory McIlroy will be chalk. If you think you're getting Rory at any type of uh, ownership premium, you are wrong. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't play him. Let's let's run through Rory McIlroy here very quickly. So helps that he's coming off a T4 and a T5 in the last two times he's teed it up. Let me show you his uh here's his PGA tour PGA championship excuse me history so he had a four year stretch so four out of the last five years he won twice had a T8 and a 17th place and it's even better at Quail Hollow so <laughs> this is wild here's Rory here is the seven times he's played it he's played Quail Hollow he's won twice and he has six top tens in out of those seven starts. Um, you're not going to get him at a premium, but this dude absolutely tears this course up. I do have one more little visual for you. Um, this is everyone who has played Quail Hollow at least three times. I'm sorry, twice, at least twice since 2007. Rory's played it seven times, averaging 93 DraftKings points. You can see there's a couple other names on here we're going to talk about. But um, Rory just jumps off the charts as the best option 
across the board, playing well, unbelievable course history, unbelievable tournament history. If you're playing a lot of GPPs, I'll probably fade him to some degree, but it's not without a lot of risk because the dude is, is, is really in prime shape uh, for this week. Now, the guy that I'll probably be overweight on from a, from a GPP mindset, from a um, game theory mindset is, is Dustin Johnson. So he drops down to now 11,400. He's the third most expensive player on the slate. He's, depending on the sports book, the odds on favor to win this thing or tied with Rory or, you know, he's nine to one and Rory's eight to one, whatever. It's very close. And despite not really playing well since the Masters, so he hasn't played well since the Masters, right? That back injury with the, with the trip down the, uh, down the flight of stairs. He has basically five top 15s in his last eight starts. So DJ's worst game or his, or not his A plus game, his like B minus game is better than a lot of guys A game. Uh, he is just so good with how long he is off the tee. This feels like a course that's going to set up for him. I imagine that so many owners are going to opt to take Spieth. They're going to opt to take Rory. They're not going to be able to afford two of these guys. So DJ to me feels like the odd man out on Monday afternoon. I don't know what the rest of the industry is thinking yet, but DJ to me right now feels like the odd man out. We can look at his um, at his history here. Let's look at his. I don't think he has great Quail Hollow history because I don't think he's played it much. Yeah, here he is. So hasn't played the Wells Fargo at Quail Hollow um, in five years. So not a lot of history there, but his PGA Tour history. Geez, I keep saying PGA Tour. PGA Championship history is pretty good. So he missed the cut last year, but um, you know, two top eights in the last two times before that, that he teed it up and he tacks on a T5 and a T10 a couple of years ago as well. So um, I have very little concerns here. I think he's a great GPP option. Um, and obviously he's, he's very capable of winning this thing. A lot of other big names in here. Uh, Matsuyama winning last week. It's always hard to imagine a guy is going to back it up, but we've seen it a couple times already this year. Um, I just, I just don't know if it's worth it because now everyone's kind of flocking to Matsuyama after the dominant performance that he put up last week. I still think he's a good play. If he didn't win last week, I'd probably be touting him right now. I think he's fine. I just, I don't, I'm probably not going to love the way his ownership ends up. And there's just something about Jason Day um, who I feel like is knocking at the door. Okay, we, we know everything about Jason Day. He's having, you know, a, a down season dealing with this stuff with his mom. I've talked about him a lot here. He's gone low a couple of times in his last six rounds. So you can see he's got a 66 and a 65 here in two out of the last six rounds he's played. If, if you watch when he's playing, he's flashing that Jason Day. Like he's flashing that, being able to throw darts, being able to just be an, an um, excellent off the tee. He just has to put four rounds together. And I imagine it's going to happen at some point. The guy's too good for him to not get, to, to not get back on track. And I'm willing to invest a couple weeks early so that I can catch when Jason Day goes out and wins one of these things. Um, you know, just because if you wait, if you wait until he wins the, a tournament, everyone's going to be on him. You're not going to benefit from it. And here is Jason Day's, um, I mean, just look at the last four years at the PGA Championship. A second place and a win, a T15 and a T8. And despite that, despite that really good tournament history, I wonder what that ownership is going to be just because he's been off the radar for so many players and, you know, this field is so deep this week. So Jason Day is at least somewhat interest, interesting to me again this week. All right, I think there's a couple um, decent options here. So Phil Mickelson. I don't talk about Phil often. Um, tends to shoot himself in the foot quite a bit by making way too many bogeys. You can see that he can go low. I mean, we know that. We know that about Phil. Comes off a 67 in the final round at the Bridgestone, which is a good sign, right? Like, you always want your guys playing well coming into um, the previous tournament. So I always look at, like, the last round or the last two rounds. But if I flip back to this, this is what makes me so interested in Phil. And in the last 10 years, Phil has played at Quail Hollow 10 times. And he is averaging 89 DraftKings points. I just told you 
how insane Rory has been, and he is only averaging four less points than Rory is in the same time span. And he's played more tournaments. You know, those two guys are head and shoulders above the rest of the field here. So Jason Day, third, 11 points behind. So these two are really in a class of their own. And I just told you how much I loved Rory for those reasons. You know, it's hard to not want to invest in Phil for kind of that, that, that same thing, that, that magic that he can come back to. And again, he's just a guy who needs to put all four rounds together. So um, I'll be interested to, again to see Phil's ownership because a major usually gets a lot of casual players and he's a very public popular player. So I, I, I wonder what his ownership is going to be, but at 8,500 bucks, you know, in DraftKings scoring, he doesn't do that bad. Like he's going to make a lot of bogeys. Um, but how many, uh, birdies he makes usually helps him out in draft King scoring. It's better than him just rattling off, um, you know, a bunch of pars in a row. So I think he's, I think he's worth a look. Charlie Hoffman will be no secret. Um, you can see a second place and a third place in the last two times he's teed it up. Let me see if I can pull this up for you. And again, these, um, this is a, a new tool for me. This is, um, I call these the data visuals, and this is, this is new for me as of a couple weeks ago. Again, also available on DFS On Demand. And let me get to Charlie Hoffman here. And let's just go back to May 14th. So let's look at his stretch here. So this is May 14th, the Players' Championship. He has not missed a cut in 10 tries, right? Um, look at this. I mean, just averaging 78 DraftKings points in this length of time. If you look at the spreadsheet here and we go to the recent tab, here's Charlie Hoffman, who in the last 10 weeks on tour has made seven cuts in a row. He's made all seven and only Hideki Matsuyama has scored more DraftKings points per round than Charlie Hoffman in that time frame. So you've got a guy who is, what, less than one DraftKings point per round behind Matsuyama, and he's nearly $3,000 cheaper. Because of that price tag, I, I don't think, like, I think Charlie Hoffman's going to be super highly owned. I think he's going to be super highly owned, but um, playing really well, and it's, again, really, really hard to overlook someone with, um, with a game like that right now. Oh, okay, here's someone that I think might be able to win you a GPP. And um, it's definitely a flyer, right? Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not super thrilled to play Brant Snedeker. Um, but Sneds has not teed it up since, what is that, the 22nd, so three weeks or so. Um, dealing with the rib injury, but you, the thing about these guys, and, and I'm always nervous to a, a, little bit to a little bit to roster someone after they're dealing with an injury, but these guys usually don't come back unless they're fully healthy. And that's what you saw at the Open Championship. Snedeker withdrew. So to me, by him playing, that says he's ready to go. He's 100%. Sure, there's a chance he gets in the thick, wet, rough, and injures himself and withdraws. Absolutely, he's a higher risk of that than others are, but I'm not sure that that's a very high risk. Um, if you remember Snedeker, the last two times he's teed it up has two top 15s, right? He was playing well before the injury. If we go to his, this is his PGA Championship performances, he has two top 13s in the last three years. And, you know, he's made the cut four straight times. So here's a guy who the last time he played was playing well, has at least a dis, uh, decent tournament history here, and he will probably be what? 5% owned? I mean, I imagine... The general public is going to avoid this guy at all costs, especially with um, the rib injury. And just this field is, in general, is, um, I mean, it's very soft pricing. You're going to be able to get anybody you want. Uh, Tony Finau checks off all the boxes again. So here you go. I mean, if you followed this series, you know what Finau's done. A lot of top 25s recently. Um, you know, two top sevens in, in three of the last tournaments that he has played. Uh, let's see. I think he's got some good, uh, 10th place at the PGA championship two years ago. And here we go. Uh, two straight cuts at quail hollow, a 28th and a 16th. So I think you can do much worse. And if I remember correctly, let me see Finau. 
And if I can find phi now, if I jump back to, okay, so here we go. So here's, um, here's Quail Hollow. Again, last 10 years, guys who have played it at least twice. Phi now has only played it twice, but 72 draft Kings points per contest. Um, what's that? Sixth best out of anyone. Um, I don't even think Roberto Castro is in this field. So basically fifth best in this field. And he will probably be pretty highly owned. All right, couple other options down here. Sorry, making sure I didn't miss anybody. I think Jimmy Walker is interesting again. He kind of faded last week, but seems to be putting it together. He is the defending champion. Zach Johnson played really well last week. Um, he's only $6,800. Whoops, sorry. Oh, okay, and then here we go. So uh, probably two more guys to talk about down here at $6,500. So Johnny Vegas, uh, you know, probably no surprise that I'm interested in him. Maybe the pricing is a little, little interesting. The guy was 60, he was 7,000 and he won the RBC Canadian Open. Then he follows that up with a, a T17 with three rounds in the 60s at the WGC. And price goes down each week. So I understand this is a much, a much tougher field or at least a larger field. But um, Vegas is hard to argue that there are many guys, at least in the last two weeks, playing better than Vegas, right? Like he wins and then he, and he goes to a, a world, golf, world Golf Championship and basically top 15s it. So hard to argue that a lot of guys are playing better than him. $6,500 is, is pretty low. And then here's one for off the radar and it's Scott Hen. So you might have seen his name pop up on Saturday at the WGC because he fired that 63. Uh, kind of faded a little bit on Sunday uh, which was disappointing, but if you look at this, so now in his last six rounds, he's got rounds of 65, 63, 69. A couple weeks ago at the Irish Open, he shot a 64. This is a guy who has been playing well recently. He's going to be very low owned in this type of field, um, playing well. And then I thought I had another stat on Hend. Let me see if I can find this real quick. I'm actually not sure where Hend went. I thought I had a really good stat on him. I thought he was up there towards um, the top of DraftKings points over the last couple weeks. But I will say this. He has played well. I mean, for $6,500, you can see what kind of value range he's in here. Um, you know, playing better on a per-round basis in terms of DraftKings points than guys like Stenson, Sergio, Mark Leishman, um, even Rory. But we know that you know, over the last 10 weeks, Rory's last couple weeks have been way better than everybody. So um, take that for what it's worth. He, d he does outpace a lot of his peers um, who are priced higher than him. So I think you could do much worse down here at $6,500. And then we will wrap it up with the odds as we always do. So looking for pricing inefficiencies um, in, in terms of Vegas odds to draft King scoring. Uh, not too many. Rose and Scott tend to be a little underpriced, it looks like. Uh, Peters and Casey as well. So pretty good example here that um, Thomas Peters only 5-1 to one less likely to win this than Justin Thomas is. And he's uh, $1,400 cheaper. So the pricing came out obviously before Peters had a really... Nice week last week, which uh, lowers his odds, but his pricing doesn't change. So when pricing comes out early, especially for majors, this type of this type of stuff tends to happen. Um, here you go, Zach Johnson stands out a little bit, uh, Duffner and Woodland just a little bit, uh, but otherwise it's pretty good. A couple hundred bucks here and there. Nothing, nothing too crazy. So there you go. That is the preview for the PGA Championship. I hope you enjoy. Um, let me know if you have any questions. You can tweet me. It's at DFS On Demand or leave a comment below. Talk to you guys soon. Good luck.